Honourable Members, please. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to look with favour upon this Parliament of the Republic of Ghana. Grant that it may perform its high duty as in thy sight. Give divine guidance to the President of the Republic. Endow members of Parliament and ministers of state with discernment and vision, integrity and courage, that through the labours of government, this land and people may be well and truly served, and that good purposes for the common human life be realised in our midst. Amen. O oh God, grant us a vision of our country, fair as it might be, a country of righteousness, where none shall wrong his neighbor, a country of plenty, where evil and poverty shall be done away with, a country of brotherhood, where all success shall be founded on service, and honor shall be given to the deserving, a country of peace, where government shall rest on the will of the people and the love for the common good. Bread the efforts of those who struggle to make this vision a living reality. Inspire and strengthen our people that they may give time, thought, and sacrifice to speed the day of the coming beauty of Ghana and Africa. Amen. Honourable Members, item number four on today's other paper, Collection of Votes and Proceedings and Official Report. Collection of Votes and Proceedings. Page one. Page two. Page three. Page four. Page Page six. Page number seven. Page eight. Page nine. Yes, Honourable Member for North Town. <clears throat> Most grateful, Honourable Speaker. Honourable Speaker, please, at page 9, item number 7, the second line. It should be Pers 1 2, standing order 78A. Pers 1 2, so if 2 can be inserted. Second line, item number 7. The spelling of Pes one. Uh, 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 no, Mr. Speaker, uh, we should insert two. Pes one two, standing order oh, seventy-eight. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, omission of two. Yes, please. So, table office, please take note. Page ten.
On your feet. Page 11. Page 11. Page number 12. Page number 13. Yes, honorable member. Thank you very much. Mr. Speaker, please, page 13, item number 11, the second paragraph. It should be seconded, seconded, and not second. Mr. Kalosa Hinkra, and seconded by the honorable member for Elembele. Uh, instead of seconded, we have second. Yes. Table of office, kindly take note. Page number 14. Yes, honorable member. <coughs> so, Mr. Speaker, please, at page 14, the second paragraph under the bold head notes, this honorable house hereby resolves as follows. Moved by the Honorable Minister for Trade and Industry, I see a combination of two names, Mr. Lankojo Chamantin, Carlos Kinsla Hinkra. Uh, those are uh, two different people, but it's been presented here as one name. And uh, it's not clear who exactly moved the motion. It's, it's, it's either Mr. Lankojo Chamantin or Mr. Kins Carlos Kinsla Hinkra but the, both names have been combined. And, uh, and Mr. Speaker, still at that paragraph, the next line, seconded by, seconded by the Honorable Chairman, it should be Chairman, if we can insert, Chairman of the Committee on Trade, Industry and Tourism. Yes, table office, please can we take note of those issues. Page number 15. Are you on your feet, Honorable Member? Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker. Uh, the committee meeting, Committee on Communications, the meeting was held on Tuesday, 13th July, and not Friday, 9th July. Honorable Member, which, which page and which page paragraph? Page 15. Page 15, the opening, item 1. First line, the committee met on Friday 9th July. It's rather Tuesday, 13th July. Okay. Okay. Another member's uh, table. Honourable member, were you were, were you at the meeting? Yes, I'm a member of the committee. Anyway, it appears the committee brought this date. So, but uh, uh, table check with the committee, and let, let's let's find a solution with the date. Yeah, thank you, Right Honourable Speaker. And secondly, my name has not been captured correctly. That's item two, X I, Anthony Menkarasoma is been captured as Anthony. And something else. Uh, how is your name spelled? Um, the correct spelling is captured on page six on the attendance, page six, two one six. Suma Anthony Menkara. Okay, table, please. Take note with the name. Thank you. Page number sixteen. Page 17, are you on your feet? Page 18, page 
page 19. <coughs> yes, I'm not member for North Town. <coughs> it's a speaker, page 19, item number 3 in attendance. We have the second and third entries. It should be Ghana National Petroleum Corporation, but we have Ghana National Petroleum Agencies. So the first and then the, the, the second. The mistake is repeated twice. I don't know if they want to say the Ghana National Petroleum Corporation Agencies, then they have to insert uh, corporation before agencies, but the way it is here, with GMPC attached, it is, it's not... Yes, table, please take note. Page 20. Yes, honorable member. Mr. <clears throat> Speaker, the Committee on Youth and Sports and Culture no, no, no. Speak up a bit? Item number three, Mr. E. T. Mensa. He was not only a former MP, but he was also a former Minister of State. So if, if that can be added, we only have a former MP and member of the Council of State, but he was also a former Minister of State. Very well. Table, please take note. And finally, page 21. Honourable Members, the votes and proceedings of the 28th sitting of the second meeting of the first session held yesterday, Wednesday, 14 July 2021, as corrected, are adapted as the true records of proceedings. Leader. May we move to item number six? Speaker, as earlier agreed, we will have to defer item five. And Speaker, with your leave, um, we'll defer the questions. Item number five, and then take item eight. Speaker, item eight on page four of the other paper. Very well. Page four, item number eight, motion by the chairman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, with your leave, I would like to move the following procedural motions together with eight. So you have 11, 8, 11, and 14. Honorable, hold on. Yes, honorable member. Mr. Speaker, in varying the other paper, we have questions, and we've not heard anything whether our questions will be taken or not taken. And all we heard was to vary the order, to defer it. They are not, you are not being fair to this country, you are being fair to us. At least let us know whether we are taking it today, or we are not taking it at all, or you are, not de or you are deferring to another day. Mr. Speaker, I saw submit you to let us know what is happening. Because we are not seeing any minister here to answer questions as, as we, we put on the order paper. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Very well. Leader, um, uh, majority of him. Speaker, I, 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 we are engaged at the conclave. We are engaged leadership. And I presume my good friend, the Honorable uh, Deputy Fip, had accordingly communicated or transmitted that agreement to you. But the decision is that um, because there is a cabinet retreat and we are expecting ministers to return 
back to work next week. We, they wrote officially to leadership, and we came to an agreement that uh, next week the questions will be accordingly programmed. That is, that is the decision, Speaker. And I will employ, I will employ my colleagues to, to, to accede for, for business to progress accordingly. Yeah, honourable members, I'm told uh, the ministers are scheduled for uh, uh, retreat, so all the ministers are not available. So that probably explains why uh, we are shifting the questions to next week. Uh, I, share, I share your view that obviously we should have uh, made members aware of it. But the plain truth is that ministers are not available for this week. Yes, uh, my, 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 my yeah. minority. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Speaker, earlier on, I was on my feet, but just that I couldn't catch your eye. The Speaker, the Honorable Deputy, the Honorable Majority Chief Whip is right. But by convention, or procedurally, whatever is discussed at the lobby before the start of proceedings, the House must be informed. And that is what, unfortunately, he couldn't do. And that is why members were raising these issues. But I believe with this explanation that the ministers have officially written to the Speaker and to the House, informing the House and seeking the leave of the House that uh, certain, due to certain reasons, the House should bear with them so that we resettle the questions. If they are being informed, I don't think the Honorable Member for whole West would have been raising the matter here as a senior member. And his raising of the issue was even confirmed by the printing of an order paper addendum. And that is why I think that we aid. So on this point, Mr. Speaker, I support the side of my colleague on the other side to seek your leave and that of the House, citing the reasons and the letters written by the ministers in question, and assuring members that those questions will be raised to be asked at the appropriate time. With that, Mr. Speaker, he can now go ahead to, draw, to move the motions that we have to proceed on today. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Very well. So, Honorable Chairman for Finance, you may now move your motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to move that the procedural motions listed as items 8, 11, and 14 be taken now. I so move, Mr. Speaker. Yes, ranking member. Mr. Speaker, I second the motion. Honorable members, these are procedural motions. So the question is as many as are in favor of the motion say aye. Those against the motion say no. Honorable members, the ayes have it. The motion is adopted. So, Honorable Chairman, you may now move the substantive motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, again for the leave to move motions 9, 12, and 15 together. 9, 12, and 15. 12, and 15. Okay. Good. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to move the motions listed as items 9, 12, and 15, and in doing so, present your committee's report. But before I do that, would you leave again, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to make some corrections uh, to the report. The tax waiver uh, being sought under motion item 15 
is 30 million 387 500 US dollars uh, on the on the on the report it is wrongly stated as 13 million 158 thousand uh, the right figure is 13 million 387 thousand five hundred US dollars and then two uh, a second correction that would you leave Mr. Speaker I'd like to make is also on the back of the report and it is it is 2021 to 2024 Mr. Speaker we know that the eighth parliament in 2021 and ends in 2025. And there will be consequential uh, corrections throughout the report in this regard. Having done that, Mr. Speaker, this, these referrals were made to your committee. We met with officials from the Ministry of Finance and the, the reference were in respect of 28 million US dollars to finance the purchase of vehicles for members of parliament of the eighth parliament and three million five hundred thousand US dollars to finance the purchase of vehicles for members of the Council of State and a request for waiver of import duties to the tune of 18 to the tune of 13 million 387 uh, thousand 500 as i said consequentially this should be corrected throughout the report mr speaker pursuant to article 103 of the 1992 constitution and orders 16 9 and 171 of the standing orders of the house the agreement and the request were referred to the committee for consideration i hereby submit the key elements of our report i request the hansa department to capture the entire content so i may take the highlights In accordance with the report of the Presidential Committee on Emoluments for Article 71 Office Holders in respect of the Parliament of January 2017 to uh, December 2021, the State is required to facilitate a car loan for Members of Parliament and Members of the Council of State. It will be recorded, Mr. Speaker, that in the seventh parliament, an amount not exceeding the city equivalent of 80,000 US dollars was provided as loans to each member to purchase vehicle. This was in respect of the seventh parliament. It's important that we make that note. Since the inauguration of the 8th Parliament on 7 January 2021, members have not been provided with any means of transport, even though they are required to perform various functions in Parliament and in their constituencies, as well as travel to various destinations for various assignments. So far, no provision has been made for members of Parliament and members of the Council of State. For this reason, the Minister of Finance is procuring a loan facility from the National Investment Bank Limited to make funds available to members of Parliament and members of the Council of State to purchase vehicles. The, the terms of the facility, the two facilities in fact, are clearly seen, are clearly seen in paragraph 4 are clearly seen in paragraph 4 of the report. The observations 
made by the committee are clearly seen in under paragraph 6 of the, of the report. The conditions precedent the repayment by beneficiaries are all listed under paragraph 6. Now, Mr. Speaker, I go to an important recommendation that the committee is making to this August House. Every four years, Mr. Speaker, at the beginning, members, please. Every four years, Mr. Speaker, at the beginning of every parliament, this country witnesses a ritual of acrimonious criticisms and vilifications by the media and sections of the public against not just members of parliament, but also against parliament as an institution for the vehicle loan arrangements assessed by members of parliament and members of the Council of State. It has not been any different this time round. The committee took note of recent concerns expressed by many sections of the Ghanaian public about the burden the current loan arrangement for members of parliament and members of the Council of State impose on the public press. These legitimate concerns are fueled by the fact that of all the Article 71 office holders, superior court judges, ministers, deputy ministers, chief executives, etc., it is only members of parliament and members of the Council of State who benefit from these vehicle loans, part of which are repaid by the state. The committee took the view that as representatives of the people, members of parliament cannot continue to leave these concerns unattended. That weakens the confidence Ghanaians have in us. We have a responsibility, Mr. Speaker, as members of parliament to reflect the values and ideals of the people we represent. Accordingly, the committee strongly recommends to, the, to Parliament that this continuation of the current vehicle loan arrangement for MPs and Council of State members. Members of Parliament and members of the Council of State should have similar duty post vehicle arrangement as other Article 71 office holders. And the committee respectfully recommends that Parliament and the Parliamentary Service take the necessary steps to ensure that this happens. We are mindful, Mr. Speaker, as a committee, that our recommendations would mean that Parliament would have to act this on the next emolument committee and also on the executive. Mr. Speaker, this is your committee's passionate recommendation. Again, the recommendation, the committee respectfully urges the House to adopt this report and approve by resolution the loan facilities and tax waivers listed under paragraph 8 of the committee's report. Respectfully submitted, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Honorable Ranking Member. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I also rise to second the motion that was moved by the Chairman of the Finance Committee. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Speaker, it is only right for members of Parliament to advert our minds to the fact that almost every four years, this August House is subject to some level of ridicule. Mr. Speaker, oftentimes, the facilities and privileges offered to Parliament are taken as if Parliament is actually benefit more than anyone other than the, all those people being covered under Article 71. Mr. Speaker, for reference, let me take you to make reference to Article 71 of the Constitution. Mr. Speaker, Article 71 says that salaries and allowances payable and the facilities and privileges available to one, the Speaker and Deputy Speaker and members of Parliament, one, B, the Chief Justice and other Justices of the Superior Court of Justice, the Auditor General, the Chairman, and the Deputy Chairman of the Electoral Commission, the Commissioner for Human Rights and Administrative Justice, his deputies, and the D District Assembly's Common Fund Administrator. 
Mr. Speaker, the D says that the Chairman, Vice Chairman, and other members of one, the National Council for Higher Education, two, the Public Services Commission, three, the National Media Commission, four, the Land Commission, and five, the National Commission for Civic Education. Mr. Speaker, it goes on to say that these expenditures should be charged to the Consolidated Fund. The Speaker, the two talks about salaries and allowances payable to the President, the Vice President, and Ministers of State. And Mr. Speaker, three of Article 72, Article 71 trace that for the purposes of this article, and except as otherwise provided in the Constitution, salaries include allowances, facilities, and privileges, and the retiring benefit onwards. Mr. Speaker, I drew your attention to this for a reason. Mr. Speaker, if, for instance, the chairman of the Land Commission, the National Commission of Civic Education, the Public Services Commission, ministers and deputy ministers of state, Mr. Speaker, the National Commission for Higher Education, the universities, are entitled for duty posts. Mr. Speaker, how on earth is it that members duty post vehicle mr speaker how on earth is it that members of parliament are denying the opportunity by the state providing us duty post vehicle mr speaker it is only right that the public needs to understand that in fact what parliament is doing now is doing some form of favor mr speaker clearly the constitution the constitution says that clearly mr speaker the constitution says that all of this entitlement should be a charge on the consolidated fund. It should have been a charge on the consolidated, on, on the consolidated fund. Mr. Speaker, in the sense that the loans that members of parliament are paying out of our own pocket is not a charge on the, on, on the consolidated fund. And that is why it is important for all of us, all of us to accept that the time has come, the time has come for us going forward, Mr. Speaker, to accept, to accept that the time has come for us to have duty post vehicles so that we can use it for the purposes of our uh, 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 the job that we do. And when we leave office, probably these vehicles will be made available to the speech. The speaker, I don't think that the chairman and the council of the university deserves better than members of parliament. I do not think that the, com the lands commission deserves better than parliament, members of parliament. I do not believe, also, Mr. Speaker, that the Public Services Commission, the commissioners, deserves better than members of parliament. It's because we speak, all of them, every single year, every, every four, five years, Mr. Speaker, they get one cross-country vehicle and one saloon vehicle. For the work that they do, every four years, every four years, two vehicles, Yet, Mr. Speaker, members of Parliament are giving loans to procure vehicles. And that is why, Mr. Speaker, we have firmly recommended to this August House and want to urge members that the time has come for all of us to accept that going forward we will not accept these car loans. It shouldn't be a car loan. We also deserve duty post vehicle. And so we want to urge members to reject car loans going forward. We, we can understand that the Ministry of Finance had said to us at the committee that they did not prepare in the budget that was presented to us to buy cars for government of Ghana, uh, for Parliament of Ghana. And for that reason, they cannot be in a position to provide us vehicles as we speak. And so going forward, a firm recommendation will be made to the Monument Committee that members of Parliament also deserve to be treated same as we are treating other Article 71 office holders. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, to conclude, to conclude, Mr. Speaker, members of Parliament since 1992 has been subjected, 1993 has been subjected to radical. People believe that we are giving car loans that we do not deserve. Mr. Speaker, this impression is piling on piling on and piling on. No one knows, no one knows what this will end up tomorrow. Mr. Speaker, it is time for us as members of parliament and being the representative of the people to listen to what the public is saying. And if members of parliament fail to listen to what the public is saying, Mr. Speaker, 
all of us, we have all become endangered. We are all endangered species. And nobody knows what will happen to us. And that is why we, the members of the Finance Committee, all of us, Mr. Speaker, we are recommending firmly to you that let us heed this advice. Accept what the public is saying. Reject the car loans going forward. And ask them that they should treat us same as they are treating every single Article 71 office holder. That is what we are asking for. Mr. Speaker, that is important. Mr. Speaker, that is why, Mr. Speaker, we made this passionate appeal to you. Mr. Speaker, to conclude, to conclude, honorable members, to conclude, honorable members, to conclude, honorable members, Mr. Speaker, we are pleading that all of us, all of us should come together, all of us should come together, not even a single member should decide to be working alone on this matter. We should come together and reject this going forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable members, the motion has been moved and has been seconded. It is now before this August House for consideration. So, I, I guess a lot of people are interested to contribute to this particular. So, I will begin with Honorable Member for Asante Achim Central. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for giving me the opportunity in supporting the motion on the floor. Mr. Speaker, I'll be very brief on the proposal that has been made by the chairman of the committee. I am a member of the committee, and we unanimously proposed that going forward, this car loan must be rejected. As a member of parliament, you get to your constituency and you are being ridiculed. You move around the country and you are being ridiculed. Mr. Speaker, members of parliament are day by day becoming endangered species. Mr. Speaker, my friend on the other side, as is Honorable Atoforsen, forgot to state that the other officers under Article 71 office holders, they are not just giving duty post vehicles, they are giving entertainment allowance, they are giving free cars, and we get none of these. And yet, we are subjected to insults and ridicule. Going forward, I think members of parliament cannot continue to allow themselves to be ridiculed. Rather, Mr. Speaker, we are proposing that under Article 71 office holders, it is not only a legislature, the legislature, the executive is under that, and the judiciary is under that. Why are we being discriminated against? Mr. Speaker, when the loans have not even been approved, our salaries, the part that we have to pay, are being deducted as source. And this has been done since January up to date. And yet, the reward we get is for us to be ridiculed. Mr. Speaker, if all of us could come together and fight for this request and the proposal that had come, I think that would be better for Parliament. And going forward, no one would insult any parliamentarian. The public thinks that we do not deserve this, that is a loan that we pay for, we do not deserve. My, Mr. Speaker, we need this to actually do the work that the state had assigned to us as parliamentarians. I rest my case. Thank you. Yes, Honorable Member for Prue West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Parliament or the legislature is the real representative of the people. If you take the three arms of government, Mr. Speaker, it is only Parliament that is dissolved any time the constitutional order is truncated. The executive stays, whether it be military or police or a combination, the judiciary stays in office, except Parliament, any time there's a truncation 
education. And therefore, to subject parliament to the ridicule that we have been through, Mr. Speaker, is to directly undermine democracy. Parliament is the symbolic representation of democracy. There is no system without the judiciary or the executive. But in our country's history, on at least three or more occasions, Parliament has been suspended or dissolved. Mr. Speaker, therefore, this car loan issue and the ridicule that Parliament has been subjected to goes to the root of democracy. If we cherish democracy, then we must protect Parliament. There are three co-equal arms of government, and yet one arm is consistently and daily subjected to ridicule, ridicule of the worst kind for taking a deal that is worse than a deal that the two other arms of government enjoy. Mr. Speaker, if the Ghanaian people believe that no one should have an official vehicle, then let's say so. Yes. Mr. Speaker, in the academia, deans and sim people in similar position have official vehicles. The security services, the top, top echelon, have official vehicles. It is only parliament it is only Parliament that the Ghanaian state does not think we deserve official vehicles and we should rather have subsidized loans. A loan is a loan, whether it is subsidized or unsubsidized. And so, Mr. Speaker, I rise to add my voice to the call for a rejection of any future car loans. Thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Honorable Member for Akinswadru. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to support the motion on the floor for the approval of the uh, loan facility to purchase vehicle for members of Parliament and the Council of State. Mr. Speaker, ordinarily I wouldn't have even added my voice or even say more to what my colleagues have already said. But it is important, and I make a few comments here. Mr. Speaker, I've heard my colleagues saying that they are recommending that going forward, members should reject the loan, car loan facility. Mr. Speaker, it is not a matter of rejecting. It is a constitutional imperative. It's not a matter. We have no choice. We cannot recommend to anybody. This is a constitution which says that Article 71 of this order must be taken care of by the states. So we shouldn't pretend and as, I mean, behave as if we are making anybody uh, uh, some sort of a favor. We are not making anybody a favor. Mr. Speaker, sometimes when you go out and you hear how people lambast members of parliament, as if we are nothing. Mr. Speaker, as if we are nothing. And I know most majority of members here are, are people of substance. All of us. Most of them have their careers. They have decided to sacrifice to represent their people and all that we can get from the people. Mr. Speaker, if the state or the people, that is what they want, that the state should provide members with official post vehicle. Mr. Speaker, so be it. For me, that will be a very good decision. Because averagely, Mr. Speaker, if the state is to provide the legislative arm of government with duty post vehicle, members sitting here, averagely, on a monthly basis, you will be serving almost about 15,000 Ghana Do you know how much that money can do for you? You can put that money, you can save that money and use it for something because you are paying, they are deducting you your loan. You are servicing your car. You are paying your drivers. You are paying insurance. Put all together. 
and you see how much you are spending every month on this vehicle. So we have to make sure, make sure that the constitution which says that the state must provide is being respected by the executive. And we are carried on by that. We cannot be the, 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 the holders of the purse. Then we find it difficult. We are approving the budget for the state without approving the budget. The state cannot function. And we find it difficult to even get those, the needed items that we have to use to carry on or to do our job. So, Mr. Speaker, I support the decision or the recommendation, but we want to state it emphatically that this is a constitutional imperative and we must respect what the constitution has said and going forward that should be the posture of the house that should be the posture of every member of this house we are not interested in the money that you are going to give it to us how much will that money do to anybody here because you are going to use it to buy a vehicle to use for official duty and constitutional and constituency work so we are not interested about the money we are interested about how we will be mobile to carry and do official duties of this country. And with this word, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity. Yes, Honorable Richard Echampo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, uh, for the opportunity to support the motion on the floor. Mr. Speaker, a lot has been said about the loan facility the conditions and then uh, the recommendation by the committee. It's like uh, members have made their position uh, forcefully and a member of the committee, Mr. Speaker, to have my colleague who just spoke, Honorable Kennedy Osenya Kong. We are not rejecting anything. We are rejecting the current arrangement because the speaker, if you read the constitution, there's no way that members of parliament should be given a loan facility to procure vehicle, work for government, travel from Accra to their constituency, and pay part of the loan from their own salaries. You can't find this in the constitution. So this is the current arrangement we are rejecting. We are not rejecting any duty post vehicle or any arrangement. We are rejecting the current arrangement, which cannot find any expression in the constitution. Because all those officers who come under Article 71, it is clearly stated how they should be catered for. Why are we trying to put in place a regime which will go to the detriment of members of parliament? Yes, so the population that we serve will not appreciate what we do for them. We raised the issue of the committee, Mr. Speaker. We wanted to reject it entirely in the 8th parliament. But the question is, they started a deduction from January 2021 to June 2021. So if they're going to refund the money, some members can go to court and they will charge interest on the deduction made on members' account. So we said, okay, let's hold it there. They've started a deduction for six months. Let's take the loan for the uh, eighth parliament. Going forward, if some of us will proceed to the ninth parliament or whatever, this arrangement should be curtailed. Government must provide duty post vehicle for members of parliament. As my ranking member and the chairman stated, fuel it, pay for the insurance, maintain the vehicle. Right. When the guy gets caught, the government must take care of it. And we will do the mathematics. We will get to the conclusion to see who is losing. We are paying more than necessary than what the state is paying for other officers. So enough of the backlash, enough of the insult. Mr. Speaker, this is not the time to divide ourselves. And it's not that we are angry with anybody. We've been so uh, sensitive to the plight of the Ghanaian people. The people that we represent, they voted for us. They are saying they don't like this kind of arrangement. If you listen to our, the people who voted for us, we are going back to our roots. Let's go to Article 71. What is the uh, uh, provisions at Article 71? Government must provide vehicles for members of parliament. Any other arrangement contained under Article 71, members will be obliged to enjoy it. So that by the end of the day, 
from 2025 to 2028, a car loan arrangement will never be presented to this house for the public to get any information about it, to insult MPs, to raise any issues. So that at least sanity will prevail in our body politics. Because we're going to be yesterday we met very high ranking uh, members in uh, our society. They are also complaining that our body politics is deteriorating. Indiscipline is creeping in, into our body politics. An insult upon insult. Nobody is trying to read minutes into what is happening. People getting in information, trying to find out, to interrogate it. What is it at all we are talking about? 28 million for uh, 275 members of parliament. That's the story. And then everybody is saying, MPs are giving 28 million uh, dollar facility loan. Meanwhile, it will not be charged against the national debt. It's not part of the consolidated fund. Mr. Speaker, the sad aspect of it, after you've served for the four years, the loan agreement is tied to the facilitating bank. MPs has no business selling the vehicle. Even if you want to sell the vehicle, the tax waiver on the vehicle, you have to go and pay the tax before you can dispose of the vehicle. Look at this kind of arrangement that many people don't understand it. But they think you get free coupon, free vehicle, everything free. And people are insulting members of parliament. How can you give me a car? I pay for it for 48 months. By the end of the period, I can't even sell the car. We've said a lot. And uh, getting the sense of the house, all of us should come together. Going forward from 2025 to 2028, the business of car loan to members of parliament should be the theme of the past. I thank you very much for the opportunity. Yeah. Yes. Honorable Davis Opoku. Thank you very much, Vice Honorable Speaker. The Speaker, I rise to support the motion um, for this August House to pass the the loan agreement for the purchase of vehicles for members of parliament. Mr. Speaker, perhaps the public do not appreciate the kind of work we do as members of parliament. I have seen on social media and elsewhere where people have suggested that we come and spend two to three hours in the chamber and all we do is yeah, yeah, and they think that is a job that the MP does. Using my my, my, my work as a member of parliament, for, 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 for example, in the last three to four weeks, there has not been any weekend that I've stayed in my, in my house. I've been in various committee meetings, meeting agencies of state in and outside the crowd. And I do this fueling my own vehicle. Sometimes you may have to rent vehicles from your very meager salary that you receive as a member of parliament. I think it's about time that we went out there, explained to the public our real work as members of parliament. I think that, that, is, that is a missing gap, and that is why the general public would want to rise up and say that we are virtually doing nothing and we are being paid um, a huge sums of money. Mr. Speaker, it's important that we let the public know that our work is tedious. We have opted to do this work because we love Ghana and we, will, we are ready to serve Ghana and it's important that we are supported with the very facilities that we demand or we require in doing our work. And it is on this, on, on this call that I support the, the motion and I urge the House to accept and perhaps to also contribute in saying that in the next parliament, we should seek for the, that which belongs to us. We should seek for the right thing to be done. Giving us loans, taking uh, huge sums of money from our account will not solve the problem. The state should be ready to provide our vehicles. The state should be ready to provide the necessary facilities that we need to ensure that we function effectively as members of parliament. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity. Yes. Honorable Open Yuta Brapa. Most grateful, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity to contribute to the motion. I would like to begin by commending the Finance Committee of Parliament for a diligent job done. And the chairman of the committee has very well articulated 
the sense of the committee and has captured the essential issues that must agitate our minds and that we must focus on. It is important, Mr. Speaker, that in this discussion, we emphasize that as members of parliament, we are men and women of good conscience. We are men and women who have opted to serve the people of this country. Contrary to a lot of the MP bashing out there, contrary to the name calling, contrary to the vilification, we are also human, we have a heart, and we mean well for this country. We are not in public office to seek our welfare. We are not in public office to amass wealth. We are not in public office only to care about our creature comforts. That point must be emphasized. And often, Mr. Speaker, it is really heartbreaking when the impression is created as though the 275 members of parliament of this house are here just for ourselves. We are not here for ourselves. We are here for the people of Ghana. We went to the people and offered ourselves with a vision to serve them and to deliver on the hopes and aspirations of our people, of our forebears, and to achieve for our collective good a country that is based on success, on progress, on development, that our people will be well and truly served, and that their well-being at all times will be our focus. That is what we wake up every morning to do. So, Mr. Speaker, we need to reassure the good people of this country that it has never been about ourselves. It has never been about our families. It has never been about our friends. It is about our constituents. It is about our people. And evidence of the work we do, even going out of our constitutional mandate, to provide assistance, to do developmental projects, to carry out interventions, which otherwise should be the forte, should be the responsibility of the executive. We, beyond lawmaking, carry out all of these initiatives so that our community will be better than we came to meet it. So that point must be emphasized. Having said that, Mr. Speaker, Article 71 must be revisited and must be discussed dispassionately and thoroughly. The provision is clear. There are three arms of government. And these three arms must receive fair and equitable conditions of service. We cannot have three arms of government where one arm appears constantly undermined, constantly shortchanged, constantly discriminated against, and that arm is so weak, it's wobbly, and, it, and it's as though we do not want that arm. We need to decide as a country, do we want to operate a democracy of three arms, the executive, the judiciary, and the legislature, or we want to operate a two-arm democracy. And I do not know of any democracy anywhere in this world which operates without a legislative arm, without a parliament, without a national assembly, whatever so-called. Mr. Speaker, we need to reassess our commitment to democracy. If we are committed to democracy, then we must be interested in the principles of democracy, the concept of checks and balances. So let us, as a people, assess what must be done for these three arms of government and make sure we, we proceed fairly, equitably, and not discriminate against each other. As has been noted by earlier contributors, in the executive arm, 
in the judiciary, the state is able to provide vehicles, is able to take care of the mobility of officers in those hands. And it is not only the provision of vehicles. If you are Minister of State, you have two vehicles, a saloon vehicle, and you have a land cruiser. If you are Minister of State, you are provided a driver, fuel, insurance, maintenance. You do not have to contribute towards these matters. Let the public know that all along, for parliamentarians in this country, we hire our own drivers, take care of our own fuel, insure our vehicles, we are responsible for the maintenance. And often it's a car loan for one vehicle. So let there be equity. We, if, we do, if we come to an understanding that we don't think that we should provide vehicles for Article 71 office holders, then let that be the case. And we all swim along. If vehicles must be provided, then let it be provided equitably. That is why some of us have said that if this car loan arrangement will continue to just agitate the public and cause animosity, we should do away with the car loan arrangement. And let's have what pertains in the judiciary and in the executive where there is a vehicle pool, we probably will not even ask for two vehicles. We will not be asking for all the other largesse that come with it. But just provide vehicles that will help members of parliament carry out their public duties. Because it's a public mandate that you have. It's a public mandate. It's a public mandate that we are performing. It's not a private mandate. It's a public mandate. So, Mr. Speaker, these are fundamental issues that we must all recognize. So I commend the Finance Committee for stating that from hence, this will be the last car loan facility. And that moving forward, this country must attain equity. There must be fairness across the board, legislature, judiciary, executive. It is in that spirit, Mr. Speaker, that my honourable colleague, the honourable Patrick Buama, the Member of Parliament for Kaike Central, and I have decided that based on the, the recommendation of the Finance Committee and the consultations that we have held, we are stepping down our motion, which motion was to move this House to reject this facility. At least there is some convergence now that this is not the way to go. We cannot keep pitching ourselves against the general public. It is not sustainable. It is not good for the stability of our democracy. Finally, Mr. Speaker, finally, and Mr. Speaker, this point is a very important one. Finally, Mr. Speaker, I believe that the time has come for us to revisit the work of the Constitutional Review Commission. This whole Article 71 arrangement as it is now, because of how it is perceived that I scratch your back, you scratch my back, executive approves for the legislature and legislature approves for the, for the, for the, for the executive. We are not winning the public debate, we are not winning sympathy, and it appears that confidence in Article 71 officers has been eroded totally. Moving forward, let's adapt what is in the Constitution Review Commission. Let's have an independent emoluments commission to determine all these matters for us. Let us remove ourselves so we are not determining who gets a car, what car, and all of that. Let us just remove ourselves. The United Kingdom did that in 2010, after the MPs expenses scandal in 2009. They now have an independent parliamentary standards authority that determines... The Honourable members, please. Order. So, Mr. Speaker, please. In, conclusion, in conclusion, I believe that 
the time has come to carry out a total overhaul of the Article 71 provision so that we can take ourselves out and stop, as it were, setting ourselves up against uh, the general public. I thank you very much for the opportunity. I, su I support the motion. Yes, Honorable Member for Abuya Pasau. Thank you, Right Honorable Speaker, for the opportunity to contribute to motion number nine. Honorable Speaker, with the greatest of respect, I'm beginning to wonder whether people are appreciating the essence of democracy. And that if we do not have confidence in this constitution that has governed this country since 1992, then I'm coming to some conclusion that some people want to, us to turn this book into shreds and retreat into autocracy and the other forms of oppressive regimes. But if we want to pay due regard to a constitutional rule, and there's a group of people called members of parliament, who for the sake of the people they represent, have endured sacrifices since 1992. And for our generosity, we have been insulted, vilified, and are sometimes looked down upon as if some favor is being done us. I, it gives me a lot of pain. Because if you pay regard to Article 71, and I want to read it because it's very important, I speak out without grant permission. As 71 1 of the Constitution, the salaries and allowances payable at the facilities, emphasis facilities, and privileges available to the Speaker, the Deputy Speaker, and members of Parliament. That is A. B. The Chief Justice and other justices of the Superior Court of Judicature, the Auditor General, Chairman and Deputy Chairman of the Trial Commission, the Commissioner for Human Rights and Administrative Justice and his deputies, District Assemblies Common Fund Administrator, the Chairman, Vice Chairman, and other members of the National Council of Higher Education, howsoever described, the Public Services Commission, the Media Commission, the Media Commission, the Lands Commission, the National Commission for Civic Education, being expenditure charged on the consolidated fund shall be determined by the President on the recommendation of a committee of no less than five persons appointed by the President acting in, in accordance with, and with the advice of the Council of State. The salaries and allowances payable and the facilities available to the President the Vice President, the Chairman, and the other members of the Council of State, members of State and uh, Ministers of State, Deputy Ministers, being charged on the Consolidated Fund, shall be determined by the President on the recommendations of the committee referred in Article 1. For purposes of this article, right now, Speaker, this is very important, and except as otherwise provided in this Constitution, salaries in include allowances, facilities, and privileges and retiring benefits or awards. It seems to me that on a proper interpretation of this con constitution, it is only the legislature that has been generous. The rest of them have enjoyed these facilities. It is only the legislature that we are giving some amount of money which they want to call a loan, and this law we pay for. The Chief Justice of the REM never pays for any car loan. As a matter of fact, he's enjoying facilities, a good Mercedes Benz. I wonder if, Honorable uh, Kujoto, by reason of where you are, you can enjoy Mercedes Benz. There is a whole a um, uh, uh, four by four vehicle at his disposal and he has there's even security vehicles utility, utility. utility vehicles and, and what is very interesting that those who run these facilities 
are paid by the state, and the cost is charged the consolidated fund. We don't want to talk about insurance and the rest of it. We are the ones at the end of the joke that we pay for the car loan, we, we, we buy our own fuel, we find money to service our vehicles, we pay our drivers, and what about the extra uh, uh, parliamentary activities? How many of these Article 71 holders will have these uh, long queues <laughs> and done where citizens of this country are coming to exact monies and how many of them will drive their four by fours to the village to attend funerals and, and, and even provide coffins for people who are, who, are, who are in need of money? So, Madam Speaker, this house, including all the other households that we have succeeded, they've paid a very heavy price. And I want all those who are discerning and they claim in their rooms and uh, 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 the media houses that they love democracy, that if they don't believe in the legislature, that we should tear this book into stress. This book is not of no consequence unless we pay regard to this house. This house is the nucleus of power. And if we want to even enjoy a modicum of what I call a necessary facility to make the work, excuse me, say, operational, and some people have troubles with that, I'm afraid, then we are sitting this book upside down and we don't even understand the book. So, Randall Speaker, I think the committee has done a yeoman's job and they are saying that the recommendation, um, um, the recommendation is clear that we should be treated in future as Article 71 holders. I'm afraid it is only a recommendation. It's not binding on the on the on the parliament, the successive parliaments at all. It's not binding at all. It's a mere recommendation. Honourable Speaker, before I sit down, I do not want us to go into the arithmetic of what has happened. That for those of us who sacrificed and took a loan and paid for the loan, immediately we go into Article 71. The mathematics will weigh heavily on the consolidated fund. And all those people who have sacrificed should go back for their money. So the monies that the drivers are entitled to, we should go back for it. The monies that the we use in servicing the vehicles, we should go back for it. The fuel, uh, the fuel that we, 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 we bought for these vehicles and the insurance payments, we should go back for it. And when it is calculated that way, the public will measure properly the huge financial cost to a member of parliament. And then they'll begin to, we begin to earn some respect. But Randall right Speaker, others have enjoyed these facilities and Article 71. And I still enjoy it. All this while at our expense. And I don't know whether we have a situation of potatoes and green tomatoes. We pay you for car loans and we are being insulted to both. Right, Mr. Speaker, this is what I want to add to this motion, and I pray that uh, those who are on the sidelines will come to terms with this great book, the Constitution. But if democracy is expensive, then let's try autocracy. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes. Uh, all the contributors has the one sided. I want to give the lady the opportunity to also contribute. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity. Mr. Speaker, I rise to support the motion. In supporting the motion, I have a few comments that I wish to make. Mr. Speaker, listening to the issues of the car loan, MPs can liken themselves, or members of parliament can liken themselves to a person sitting by the river and yet using spittle to wash his or her hands. We sit here and then we approve all kinds of budgets, all kinds of loans, and what have you. And yet, for a loan that we will have to pay 
We are being subjected to all types of insults. Mr. Speaker, if you go into the airwaves especially, especially the shows that come up and people, they believe they are being listened to, you wouldn't believe that some of them have even got friends who are members of parliament. Mr. Speaker, the painful aspect of it is that you have no right whatsoever to even use a password out of that loan for any other thing apart from purchasing the, the, the vehicle. You cannot even transfer it, Mr. Speaker. The annoying aspect is that those who make this noise and say all kinds of things about members of parliament have got their own senior most officers who are being given vehicles. Nobody mentions their names. Mr. Speaker, to mention a few, some of them are the Police Services Commission. They get a, 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 they get a vehicle which they use. Nobody mentions their names. The National Media Commission, the Lands Commission, the National Commission on Civic Education, Free Fuel, Free Driver, Free Maintenance, Free Insurance, everything is free for them. But when it comes to us, simply because we have laid low for quite a long time, we are being taken for a ride. In fact, when some people talk to you, they talk to you as if you were not even riding on a bicycle before you came to Parliament, not to talk of even being able to buy a car. They have forgotten that most of us here are workers. We have been responsible and we have been in one way or the other. Mr. Speaker, I can assure you that even the coffee we buy at the coffee shop, the coffee that we buy at the coffee shop, some people out there believe that we take the coffee for free. People believe that we are giving lunch for free. Mr. Speaker, there is nobody who will save us. We will have to save ourselves. If it has been put there that we should be given means of transport, let us follow the rules and regulations and have that done in the future. Mr. Speaker, it is painful that while you have not yet even taken the loan, while you haven't gotten the car, while you are even still struggling with the car that maybe you might have bought four years ago, your salary is being deducted. Mr. Speaker, who on earth, all those who are talking, how many of them will go looking for a loan, they haven't gotten the loan, and yet their monies are being deducted or they pay back when they even haven't gotten the loan. This is what is happening to us. Mr. Speaker, it is a shame that while we are talking about democracy and talking about the three arms of government, the legislature, the judiciary, and the executive, we tend to pounce on one arm and make them look whatever people think that they can call trash, excuse me to say. Meanwhile, we are the lawmakers. We are those who go back, go back to our constituents. We are those who respond to every need and cry from the constituencies. Mr. Speaker, go to some of these constituencies, and if you are told to go to some of the villages, most of these will, who are benefiting from the vehicles will never ever go there. They do not even go to their various districts or villages with the vehicles, Mr. Speaker. We respond to everything and we respond to Ghanaians. All we are putting across is that treat us like any other Article 71 holder or office holder. Give us what is due us. Let us continue to work. Ensure that we have all the amenities. When we are leaving office, we leave your vehicle for you. And I think it will go a long way to help us. With this few words, Mr. Speaker, I thank you for the opportunity. Honorable members, I was coming to leadership, but now I've seen senior member here. I'll give, I'll give one slot to each side. So I'll give to Honorable Katie Amon, then I'll give to Mutala, then I come to leadership.
the honourable member for Nancy Asoka. But please, I urge you to be snappy. Yes. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I think my colleagues are beginning to realise how much it pays to be a senior member of this house. So let the funds flow. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I'm going to try as much as possible to be very sober. I rush in highly strong, but as soon as I got to the floor, I had a change of heart and decided to I'll be humbled by the occasion and, of course, the fact that, for me, there is an existential threat to the existence of this institution as part of government of this country. Yes. It troubles me considerably. I do understand, Mr. Speaker, that we were sent here by our respective constituencies collectively representing the entire country. It's also the case that for that reason, for that reason, Mr. Speaker, whatever it is that we do, we must be very careful that it's in tandem with the interests of the country. The persons that have agitated my mind, that have actuated my mind, that have troubled me considerably over the period, is this that, why is this that Parliament is being set upon the way it is by the country? Mr. Speaker, why is it that there isn't this amount of a problem? There isn't this amount of castigation. There isn't this amount of attack on the other institutions of this country. But as soon as it gets to Parliament, Mr. Speaker, things are taken out of contest. Mr. Speaker, I was thinking that we could go democracy Ghana style. And it, it, it really might fit. We used to have uh, democracy the presidential system of it. Actually, we started with the parliamentary element of it. We've gone to the presidential form of it. Now we have what we famously describe as a hybrid form in Ghana. That's what we operate. I think we can go a step forward. We can decide that democracy in Ghana would have two limbs. I quote to you, those of you who were not, were not at the University of Ghana in the early 80s, the late president of Libya, Muammar Gaddafi, came in there and he tried some English. He said, democracy has got two foots, one foot in Africa and one foot in America. We can decide to have democracy in Ghana, which has two foots, the executive and then the judiciary. If that is how the nation wants us to go, Mr. Speaker, we can take that route if it satisfies the gastronomy of the entirety of the population. Mr. Speaker, so be it. I think the, 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 the nation must accept the fact that everywhere in the world, democracy has come at a cost. It's never been very easy. It hasn't been cheap. Mr. Speaker, why is it that we never like dictatorship. We haven't even liked constitutional dictatorship, sure. let alone other forms of dictatorship. The bastion of democracy has always been parliament. The sovereignty of the nation has always resided in parliament. That is why collectively we represent the nation. Mr. Speaker, we haven't come here for reasons of aggrandizement. Mr. Speaker, for reasons of trying to fill our individual pockets. Mr. Speaker, it is because of the service of the nation that we represent the country, Mr. Speaker, in this house. 
So, Mr. Speaker, the last time it was a chamber. And we heard it from there. Drop the chamber. We dropped it. I came belatedly, Mr. Speaker, to know that the money was actually not going to come from the coffers of this nation. There was a donation by some foreign government who were going to help us put up a new chamber, Mr. Speaker, befitting the status of Ghana, representing the legislative arm of government. We dropped it. Mr. Speaker, car loads. I've seen people going through the arithmetic of it. Mr. Speaker, what I'm beginning to say is that if we even decided to go for the other limb of it, which is that the government should do all that has been suggested, they should raise this, they should do that, that. Well, it's going to be even more expensive for the country than what has been going on. Look, I think we should be looking into the eyes of the nation, our colleagues, and the, our, our countrymen, our countrymen, our compatriots, and we can um, plead with them. We are not here, Mzika, simply for the fact of our own, our own sake, our own well-being. Mzika, the nation, through the Conservative Assembly, took a decision that we would have to go the way of democracy. This is the way of democracy. Executive, judiciary, and Mr. Speaker, more so parliament. Without parliament, there is never a democracy so called. They should, the, the nation should calm down, calm down. We get very sad. We get very sad, Mr. Speaker, when every element that comes out of parliament is distorted, is contorted. Mr. Speaker, is cannibalized. And then there's a few days. Parliament is that, Parliament is this, Parliament is this. I see that our committee is recommended, Mr. Speaker, to the House that we're well, going forward, we should stop it. Uh, why not take, why not take the, the, this should be the last uh, occasion. Well, let's go the extra step then. Why do we want to take it for this year and not the subsequent years? So if the recommendation is that, we see, let's see it forthwith. We won't take it. We won't take it. As Russia, apparently we ourselves are giving it a misnomer. There's nothing like as Russia. Yeah. It is our salary arrears. I mean, the nation possibly doesn't know how much we are paid after the deduction, the allowance, and all that that is left of our uh, salaries. Yesterday, I went in there and asked them to print out my my what do you call it, pay pay slip. I don't want to show it to the cameras. Mr. Speaker, I mean, one institution that sacrifices so much, yes. as if the nation is already aware of, is Parliament. Uh, go to your parliament, uh, your constituency, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker is laughing because he has never the best and I know what happens there. He knows what happens in my constituency. Speaker, you cannot get into your car without satisfying a whole heap of them who have let the funds flow. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, that all comes out of our paltry pay. Mr. Speaker, there are many colleagues who have been accused of not being able to go to their constituencies, or indeed not being willing to go to their constituencies. Mr. Speaker, it is a question of ability. Uh, how much do you go with? It's finished. I checked yesterday, out of my pay and out of all our pay, Mr. Speaker, I think tax alone is about 8,000 cities. I've actually been told that we should be looking at it carefully and that we have been cheated. I'm told that all the allowances and others that have been consolidated in there, the lawyers, maybe myself included, I'm not a tax lawyer. You are laughing at me. You, the lawyer, you should be looking at it. Because we our understanding is that the, uh, the allowances do not attract uh, taxes. But these are all going, I told you, you are shaking your head or nodding your head. Have a good look at it. We are left with nothing, basically. 
why all this attack on uh, our colleagues? Well, we can all decide to resign and block. Because we can, if we do, either that another batch would want to come in or nobody will come in at all. There won't be democracy. I always want to understand. Mr. Vika, we are not here because we are appointed to come here. Parliament is not an appointed institution. We go out there competitively. We go, there is competition that goes out there. Whoever out there wants to be a member of parliament can contest independently or on the back of a particular political party. Nobody blocks anybody's chance of becoming a member of parliament. My plea to the population is that we are not in this house to cheat anybody. But they should be a little bit more sympathetic with us. When it gets to it, you recall the other day we had to get a president in place. A president. Because if there was no parliament, there was not going to be a president. We stayed overnight from 9 o'clock to next day about 12 o'clock. We were in this house to make sure that the state, the nation, had an executive a president in place. I think we are doing very well. The little whatever is thrown our way. Uh, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for the opportunity. Yes, Honorable Member for Tamale Central, please be brief. So much has been said. Thank please you, be Mr. Speaker, for giving me the opportunity to contribute to the committees of finance work. Right, Honorable Speaker, we have agreed as a people that never again should we be ruled by a military dictatorship. We agreed as a people that never again should this country be ruled by any tyrant. We have all collectively agreed that we should be ruled and the conduct of everybody in this country should be governed by a law. And that law is captured in a book called the Constitution of Ghana. The drafting of that Constitution was not done by members of Parliament. It was done by the people of this country collectively. And that is why in the Conservative Assembly, there was a representation of people in this country across all institutions, across all walks of life. And in that Constitution, they recognized that some people should be identified as Article 71 office holders. And each of these office holders are taxed with a responsibility to perform a service. The people of this country can question the service we provide. It is within their democratic right to question how we perform those services. It is within the right of the people of this country to question the services that are provided by the executive by the legislature and by the judiciary. And I won't add much, but only to say that you can have a government without parliament, but you can never have democracy without parliament. And that tells you the significance of parliament. To that extent, in performing those services, the people of this country decided that there should be some conditions made available for us to deliver the service. Right, Honorable Speaker, with your permission, I would like to read Article 98 of the 1992 Constitution. What the people of this country decided to provide for members of Parliament so as we can deliver the service they have imposed on us to deliver. And with your permission, Article 98.1, a member of Parliament shall be paid such salaries and allowances and provided with such facilities as may be determined in accordance with Article 71 of this Constitution. It goes further, 98.2, to say that a member of Parliament shall not hold any office of profit or emolument, whether private or public, and either directly or indirectly, unless permitted to do so by the Speaker acting on the recommendations of a committee of Parliament on the grounds of that. Right, Honorable Speaker, I agree with comments made by some of our colleagues. 
that we need to be seen demonstrating love for the people of this country. That we need to reassure the people of this country that we are not in here to make profit. And we are not in here for individual benefit. We are here to serve the people of this country. Let me say that in as much as I agree with such admonishment, I want to entreat myself and my colleagues. We shouldn't be pretentious about such admonishment. It shouldn't just come from our lips. We must be seen demonstrating that. If the four-wheel drive is a luxury to some members of parliament, I say that it is not a luxury to others. And I will use myself and many of our colleagues here as classical example. We have the MP for Myang who is here seated. I know the Myang constituency. It's one of the widest constituencies you can think of. It stretches up to Bimbila. I have been a member of parliament in a rural constituency before. And I had over 80 communities. Right, Honorable Speaker? We are supposed to visit our constituencies at least every week. I live here. We finish on Friday. Saturday, I'm supposed to go to Tamale. If I need to go to Tamale via public transport, I need about 13 to 15 hours to get to Tamale. So the entire Saturday would have been spent traveling. An MP who is from, let's say, Bale, my uncle who is here, or Bale Bomboy, or, Sonok, uh, 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 or even Boku Central, he needs another half day. Having gotten to Tamale on Saturday night, sleep over the next day, he will need a half day to get to his constituency. So both Saturday and Sunday would have been spent traveling. And that MP is supposed to, to be in Accra on Monday to rest. So that the next day the MP performs the duties given to him to perform by the people of this country. Right, Honorable Speaker? We can understand the sentiment. We can understand the anger of the people of this country. My position, and I believe the position of all of us, has been consistent. The position of Parliament, at least I can talk about the Sikh Parliament, and the previous Parliament that I was not a member, I listened to members of Parliament who argued strongly, don't give us any car loans, provide the vehicles so that we can perform the service you ask us to perform as people of this country. That has been the consistent position. It is not an idea of us being admonished that we should demonstrate that we love the people of this country. That is our responsibility. Let's see that in our action. But I want to caution myself and caution our colleagues. When the cameras are before you, don't try to play saint. When the cameras are before you, don't try to pretend to be who you are not. Because we know the conduct of everybody. And if we begin to question the conduct of people, I really don't think that that is what the people of this country want. With this, let me challenge you and challenge myself that I agree that we should demand, don't give us any car loan, provide the vehicles. The other members of Article 71, they are provided with vehicle free, they are provided with a driver, the state provides the driver, pays the driver, provide fuel for them, pay for the maintenance of the, of the vehicles. That is what we simply are asking for. We are asking us, treat us like any other member of Article 71. I don't think that it has ever been the position of any member of this house who says that give us the car loans. Who would see free and want to take a loan for who you pay? And I want all of us, one single member of parliament in this country, previous and present, who has never taken advantage of this opportunity. One single member. They didn't only take advantage of it, they defended same. And you cannot take advantage of something. And even this one, encouraging people to take advantage of same, yet when the cameras are put before you, you want to play the same. Such hypocrisy ought to stop. Such sincerity is what the people of this country demand of us. We need to be sincere in our conduct, we need to be sincere in our actions, and we need to be sincere in our rhetoric. With these few words, I thank you very much for giving me the opportunity yeah. to support this nation. Yeah, yes, let me now yeah, come to leadership. Leadership. Yes, uh, Honorable Afe, uh, Afeji. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I thank you and I want to urge the House to approve the report of the Finance Committee so that government can procure the loan for members of Parliament to procure the vehicles. Mr. Speaker, by the approval of this motion, 
we are saving government from bearing the full cost of the vehicles. Because members of parliament will be bearing part of the cost of the vehicle. Jessica, by approval of this motion, we are saving government from maintenance of the vehicles of members of parliament. We are saving government from providing drivers for the members of parliament. We are saving government from fueling the vehicles as well as ensuring the vehicles and maintenance. Mr. Speaker, if you compute the cost of all this, it is more ex expensive to government to buy the vehicles for members of parliament than to procure the loan for members of parliament. This is what we should make the public know that members of parliament are rather, they are rather sacrificing by bearing cost of the vehicle, part of the cost of the vehicle, and also taking care of the cost of the drivers, the fuel, the maintenance, the insurance, the cars, the tires we buy and put under the vehicle. Mr. Speaker, this education and debate must continue so that the public will know that the members of parliament are not here to take money from government for their own benefits. So that the public will know that rather the members of parliament are rather supporting government in the procurement of the vehicle. So that we can have vehicle to go to our constituencies and do our work as MPs. And we want to urge the media. We want to urge you to continue to educate the public. Mr. Speaker, it will surprise you to know that some media men who work in this parliament, when they were asked, what would the MP use a vehicle for? He said, they, so that they can buy the vehicle and go to funerals. Mr. Speaker, this is not good enough. You know what the MPs go through. In fact, we are urging the Public Affairs Department of Parliament to continue to go to radio stations and educate the public. Because the public do not know most of these things. We are part of the Article 71 office holders. The public do not know. So if the Public Affairs Department go to do the education, the public will rather appreciate that, oh, the MPs are rather doing something that is helping the country. Mr. Speaker, we have said a lot here. Look at the former members of parliament. Look at their conditions. Mr. Speaker, Article 71 office holders, some of them retire on their salaries. Do we retire on our salary as MPs? Why can't the public say we should also retire on our salaries? So let us make our position known. It's good that we are debating this motion so that the public will know what is actually the benefit that MPs are supposed to get, yet they are not getting it. So it's very important that, Mr. Speaker, a lot of you said, media take over, public affairs department, continue to do the education, go to the railway stations, let the public know what MPs go through. Every member of parliament go to your constituency before you wake up in the morning, there's long queue in, in your house. You have to attend to them. You have to disperse your salary to support your constituent to take care of their, their needs. But the public is not talking about that. Mr. Speaker, it's very, very important that we, we all, as a, as a house, should ensure that this loan is approved and as the report has recommended the public, the, the, the government, and for that matter, the public should know that we will prefer that government procure the vehicle for us, fuel it, maintain it, service it, ensure it, so that, and provide drivers, and provide everything, just like they are doing to other Article 71 office holders. We prefer that one. So that at the end of the four years, the government take the vehicle back or usher it to whoever. So the public should not lambast members of parliament simply because we have in the past not opened up all debate to the public. 
So it is very important that we do that. So, Mr. Speaker, I thank you very much for the opportunity, and I urge and urge the government that the Article 71 Emolument Committee should be established now. Mr. Speaker, as we are here, we don't even know our salaries. We are taking the salary of seven parliament. Let's know our salaries. Let's know our condition of service. Now, the committee should be established rather than waiting to the end of the four-year term before the committee comes. And when we are taking our salary arrears to, they say members are taking S Grasha. Mr. Jika, we are not doing ourselves good. We should push for the committee to be established now. The cost of democracy, we must be prepared to bear it as a country. I thank you very much, Mr. Sugar. Yes, Honorable Majority Deputy Leader. Oh, Mr. Speaker, thank you for the opportunity to add my voice to the motion on the floor. Mr. Speaker, this whole debate is arising out of the public sentiment out there which public sentiment was fueled by media reportage. And today, my friends in the media, I have these words for you. We are not attacking you, neither do we think that you are not part of us, but we are urging you to watch out on the extremities of your practice. It is getting too much and too much out of hand. Mr. Speaker, it is one thing not knowing the facts and finding out, and another thing knowing the facts and deliberately twisting it. So this whole car loan thing is an agenda of some individuals in the media to set us up against the public, because he said the public against us. And this is unfair. Mr. Speaker, this morning, the committee on this Sputnik vaccine matter had its first hearing. Soon thereafter, there was a, a city news report. And I saw a headline. I called the journalist. I said, my brother, were you present? Have you seen what you have written? It's so honorable. I am sorry. I came late. Somebody told me. And I thought that was accurate. At the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, you are creating a certain impression out there. Somebody comes to wait in my office for two hours and I want an interview. I want you to clarify something of what you said yesterday on the House floor. I clarify same for him, and I've just seen Mr. Portage. Mr. Speaker, I am happy on this car loan. It's about all of us. So we are so interested in making sure that we deal with it. Need I say again, Mr. Speaker, because it is relevant to repeat it. We all sprang from the same stock. We are partakers of the same nature. And we are the sharers in the same hope. This political class must know that if it fails to protect its vision for the country, others would help us destroy it. Simplicity. Today, my respected senior, Katie Amon, has spoken with some emotion and passion. Never in my life in this house have I seen him in that poster. Never. Mr. Speaker, you cannot practice and sustain democracy in vacuum. You cannot. It is not possible. Yes, Honorable Aveji raised the issue of life after parliament. Mr. Speaker, Two weeks after swearing in, two colleagues who had just exited 
visited me after pleasant trees. Ah, leader, your own boy, so I thought you were joking, but I was seeing them up and they were not moving. I was seeing them up, they were not moving. They said, Afeno, it is not easy. Why is there out there that politicians are in this country to enrich their pockets? No, 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 no. Let's be fair. So if it is today, it will come to you tomorrow. So when there are issues, Mr. Speaker, if today, if today, we are all coming to a certain conclusion that matters of welfare are collective. Let it be so. I am not going into the postures of some of our colleagues when this, this matter came up. I'm not going into that. I'm not going into that. But I'm reminding colleagues that we are all in this together. Let us find an appropriate way of dealing with the matter. Mr. Sika, that being said, let me emphasize a point again. That, Mr. Speaker, we must let government know what indeed is due us. It is also becoming so belated. What's our entitlement? We should discuss it openly. We should. If somebody is a minister and is entitled to an official vehicle and nobody complains, nobody talks about it, then MPs must let the public know that we need these not for the purpose of luxury, but they are a necessity. Mr. Speaker, we need them to work. But if today we say the president traveled in a certain aircraft, then tomorrow there will be an attack on the MP having a four-wheel drive. And tomorrow we trivialize everything. And Mr. Speaker, it often emanates from us as a political class. So, Mr. Speaker, we we need we need to ensure that if today we are complaining about matters of warfare, Mr. Speaker, then it is important that we remain consistent to that. Of course, I agree that this House cannot, this Parliament cannot make recommendations that will be binding on the ninth Parliament. That one we cannot. But at least it becomes a foundation upon which some argument can be made in future. So I commend the committee for its boldness in that direction. Mr. Speaker, having said that, I shall conclude by saying I fully support the motion for this House to urge the government to procure a loan, that loan which will support MPs in their parliamentary duties by way of procurement of vehicles. Mr. Speaker, the facility is long overdue. Deductions have started or commenced right from January, and MPs need to have these vehicles to do their work. I thank you so much, Mr. Speaker, for this treasure space, and I say, Mr. Speaker, God bless you. Yes, honorable members, before I put the question, let me also add my voice in commending the committee, at least for the recommendations that they've come up with, that going forward we shouldn't take the loans for buying vehicles. Uh, we are also Article 71 members. Indeed, you look at the executives, the specifically the ministers of state, and even the judiciary, when they come to Supreme Court judges, 
president nominates them and this house approved them. So how come that the appointees can get anything that they want to facilitate their work, but the appointees or the approving authorities, the society find it wrong when it comes to this house benefiting loans to buy vehicles. I think uh, members have actually expressed their, their, their sentiments very well. And we believe the, the fourth state of the realm, the media, will take it up. Because all this going on, I think they are initiated by you, the media, bringing this to the fore, and people will be discussing it to such extent that members of parliament are next to nothing. So, committee members, I think we will go with your recommendation so that going forward next time round, nobody will come out with any proposal for loan to buy vehicle for honorable members of this house. So, on that note, I will put the question. And the question is, as many as are in favor of this motion, say aye. Those against the motion say no. no. Honorable members, the eyes have it. The motion is adopted. Ye yes, honorable leader. Speaker, I will seek your, your indulgence to take uh, together Resolution number Speaker, with your leave, we will take resolution number 10, 13, 15 on pages 4, 6, and 7 together by the Deputy Minister for Finance. Yes, page number four, item number 10, resolution by the minister. Mr. Speaker, I ask for your leave to move all the three resolutions at the same time. So. Very well. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that the resolutions captured as 10, 13, and 16 on today's order paper be adopted now. I so move, Mr. Speaker. Yes, any seconder? Mr. Speaker, I second the motion. Honourable members, as many as are in favour of the resolution say aye. aye. Those against the resolution say no. no. Honourable members, the ayes have it. The resolution has been adopted. Yes, honourable leader. Uh, thank you, right, Honorable Speaker. Um, Honorable Member, I haven't called you. Honorable uh, Deputy Hip, I haven't called you. I just want directions from leadership. Yeah, he's on this floor. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, we have uh, a paper to lay. Oh, okay. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Just that one. Yes, Honourable Member. Um, thank you, Honourable Speaker. I rise under Order 91B. Um, that is a matter of privilege, sudden arising. And I am fortified by Order 28. Um, that is, with your permission, I read, notwithstanding anything contained in this order, Mr. Speaker may refer any question of privilege to the committee to the Committee of Privilege for Examination, Investigation and Report. Mr. Speaker, I hereby draw the attention of the House of comments that was made by Mr. Sami Gilfi, the National uh, Communication Officer of the NDC. Mr. Speaker, and with your permission, I read a set of it. And that is, uh, comrade, the betrayal we have suffered in the hands of the Speaker of Parliament, Right Honorable Alban Babin, the leadership of parliamentary group, particularly Honorable Haruna Idrisu, 
Honorable Muntaka Mohammed, and dozens of our MPs, is what threatened me to work hard for the great NDC to regain power. They blatantly defy the leadership of the party and betray the collective good of their, of their selfish interests. And we must not let them succeed in this particular order. Um, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, accordingly, this is an attack to the speakership and the leadership of this house. Under order, under order 27, Mr. Speaker, I want to move that this should be referred to the Committee on Privileges, as precedents in this house have already shown, and the latest was yesterday. Mr. Speaker, under, um, and I do that uh, with the strength of order 27, which also says that not standing with anything contained in this order, Mr. Speaker may refer any question of privilege to the committee. And then this is in contempt of the House or this Parliament under under 30 H. Order 30 H. And with your kind permission, I read. Order 30 H. 38 states that the following act or conduct shall constitute a breach of privilege or contempt of Parliament. So it says, publication of false, pervertive, misleading, disorder, publication of scandalous reports, books or rivals, reflecting on the proceedings of Parliament. So Mr. Speaker, I so move that by this was an attack to the Speaker and the leadership, and this matter should be referred to the Committee of Privileges. I so move, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Honorable. Honorable Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. The Speaker, I listened to my Honorable colleague on the other side very well, quoting portions of our orders where debates may be interrupted on matters of privileges. The Speaker, I was with him in the Speaker's lobby this morning together with leadership. The Speaker, respectfully, our orders are clear. And if I listen to him carefully, Mr. Speaker, all the orders he quoted, and with my, pre my presence within in your lobby this morning, I didn't hear him seeking your prior approval on such issues. And Mr. Speaker, if you go to Order 73, The Speaker, by Order 73, that is Complaints of Content of Parliament, 73A, a member may, at the time appointed for Content of Parliament, under the provisions of Order 53, that is Order of Business to the House, make by the House in the Complaint of Content of Parliament provided he has previously notified Mr. Speaker on that. Mr. Speaker, I just want to seek your guidance whether the Honorable Member has already sought your leave or notified you on this, because in the morning when we were there at the Speaker's review, this thing has come just as a surprise. But since I, that is why our orders are clear on it, he, I want your guidance, Mr. Speaker, before we proceed. Seek your guidance to know whether he has already notified you or sought your leave, or he's also ambushing you just as he has done to all of us before we can proceed. Yes, Deputy, Deputy Majority Leader. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, um, yesterday I had the occasion of raising the issue of precedence and procedural propriety. The Speaker, there was an application by my colleague, Honorable Al Hassan Suhini. Uh, that application was mounted under Order 91B, where, where my colleague quoted certain provisions and then also came under 
28. Mr. Speaker, when he finished his submission, Mr. Speaker took judicial notice of the matter and although the provisions require a motion of that nature to be seconded, a motion on contempt, and Honorable Sam George was on his feet, the, no one seconded the motion. Mr. Speaker relied on Order 28 to rule. Yes, Honorable, hold on. Yes, Honorable Member for Boko Central. Thank you very much, Right Honorable Speaker. Right Honorable Speaker, yesterday we were dealing specifically with an issue of breach of privilege that an Honorable Member of this House has breached his privileges. And so it was a matter of privilege which Order 27 specifically mentions. Mr. Speaker, what I hear the Honorable Member raise is also a matter of privilege. But what he really wants to bring before this House is a complaint of contempt. It is a complaint of contempt that he seeks to bring before this House that the conduct of an individual outside this parliament is contemptuous of the speaker and leadership of this house. And so if he's bringing a complaint of contempt, then he ought to satisfy the requirements of Order 73. So, Mr. Speaker, he is wrongly before the house. He's wrongly before the house. He's wrongly before the house. And the speaker yesterday, the speaker yesterday rightly admitted that it is about the privilege that a member of parliament has to speak freely. And that what he said raised issues of a privilege. And that is why he felt his hands were tied under Order 27. And therefore he referred the matter to the Privileges Committee to investigate. But the deputy leader is seeking to fault the ruling of the speaker yesterday by pretending that the speaker made a mistake in his ruling. That is why I'm raising a point of order against the deputy speaker, even though I have read into the substantive matter. Yes, honorable leader. Oh, oh. Mr. Speaker. Honorable having. Mr. Speaker. Our, 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 our colleagues, our colleagues, on the other side must be fair. They, Mr. Speaker, they are being selective in the manner they want to appreciate the rules. Mr. Speaker, yesterday, Mr. Speaker, yesterday, when this matter came up, Mr. Speaker relied on the standing orders. Mr. Speaker, I will read. I will read. Mr. Speaker, this posture of day, no, we keep quiet for you to make your point. Mr. Speaker, order 20... Honorable Member, kindly permit me to suspend the House for five minutes.
Mr. Speaker. Yes, leader. So, Mr. Speaker, under Order 27, it reads, notwithstanding anything contained in these orders, Mr. Speaker may refer any question of privilege to the Committee of Privilege for Examination, Investigation and Report. Mr. Speaker, the procedural propriety Honorable leader, hold on. Honorable member for uh, Tamarasen and North. Thank you very much, right, Honorable Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, under normal circumstances, I should not be rising on a point of order when the Deputy Majority Leader is on his feet. But, Mr. Speaker, he makes a wrong attribution to me, and it is important that the records capture what is accurate. Mr. Speaker, yesterday I came on Order 78 and not 91, as he attributes to me. Mr. Speaker, indeed, it was Mr. Speaker who made reference to 91, since he considered the matter that was raised as a matter of privilege suddenly arising. But I came under 78 for good reason, because, Mr. Speaker, it says under 78 that even without certain motions can be moved. But, Mr. Speaker, the, if he is coming under 91, as we are being told, then the point that has been raised by colleagues, including the Deputy Whip and Honorable Mahama Yarga, is valid because the Deputy Chief Whip says he is coming under 91, and 91 will require notice. And again, it will be wrong for Mr. Speaker to entertain this motion if he has not been put on notice yet, if they are coming under 91. And Mr. Speaker, once again, the records must reflect that I came under Order 78-2 and not 91 as he attributes to me. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Speaker, yes, honorable equity leader. relies on substance and not for and Mr. Speaker, I never misquoted him. Perhaps because Hansard is not here. But Mr. Speaker, and I'm quoting Mr. Speaker, he said, Mr. Speaker said, that even though the rule under which he came, he is not sure whether Honorable Kennedy Japan said the thing here. He is relying on 27. That was when, Mr. Speaker, I said, yes, and 73, yes. That is when I rose to draw Mr. Speaker's attention that there is some procedural impropriety. And as a student of parliamentary jurisprudence, I am drawing Mr. Speaker's attention. That notwithstanding, I respect his rule. I am saying, Mr. Speaker, on the strength of, and fortified by that ruling, which looks at substance. What is the substance? A member of the National Democratic Congress, the National Communication Officer, has used certain words against Mr. Speaker, members of this House, which words amount to contempt, which words undermine our work and authority. Let's look at 38, 38 of our rules book. Mr. Speaker, this is what 38 says. The following acts or conduct shall constitute a breach of privilege or contempt of parliament. They are disjointed. It is either a privileged matter or contempt. His contention is that the behavior, the utterances, the writings of Mr. Sami Jemfi is in contempt of parliament. And he relies on 38. 38 reads, I quote, Publication of false, perverted, misleading, distorted, fabricated, or scandalous report, books or libraries reflecting on the proceedings in Parliament. 
what proceedings was, was Mr. Sami Jenfi referring to? The appointment committee's report, which report approved of certain members, and he had occasion to question Mr. Speaker. So all that our colleague is saying is that, Mr. Speaker, don't be a judge in this matter. Simply refer it to the appropriate committee to look at the merit or otherwise. Mr. Speaker, this is what was done in the Canada Japan case. Mr. Speaker said, look, you let's give it to the committee. Let the committee now validate validate the statement of Canada Japan. And I was even saying that Mr. Suhini should have made a prima facie case because that was a, on the matter of contempt that you must make a prima facie case for con consideration. So, but Mr. Speaker said that was not necessary. It must go for the committee to look at it. So Mr. Speaker, we don't need to break Good our shoulders on this matter. Simply, Mr. Speaker, the application should be referred to the committee of privileges. Let them do their work. Mr. Sami Jelfi will have the opportunity to be heard. He would have the opportunity to have a council of his own. The applicant in this matter will have the opportunity to present the Facebook post. If it is genuine, it will be so. If it is not, then the report will come to the plenary. So an impression should not be created as though we are determining the matter now. This referral to the committee to look into it, Mr. Speaker, does not amount to any conclusion. And what is good for the Ganza? What is good for the goose is good for the Ganda. Mr. Speaker, what is good for the goose is good for the Ganda. Let us be fair as a house. Let us be fair as a house. This application must not receive opposition because it is your member. That is what you are saying. That because Sami Jelfi is your colleague, your co-comrade, you don't want this matter, this matter to be considered. That's unfair. Mr. Speaker, I humbly pray you to make your referral to the committee. It is a committee that will determine the merits of the application. I so thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, uh, majority, deputy majority. Thankfully, Mr. Speaker, you have not ruled and you have not directed on this matter yet. Mr. Speaker, as leaders in this house, we must support you. Mr. Speaker, what the Honorable Deputy Majority Leader has just said concerning yesterday, Yesterday, at the time he wanted to make his rendition, the chair has ruled. And I came, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, and based upon that, I came under order, order 98. And by order 98, I put it to the, I, I made an appeal to the chair that Per order 98, the ruling of the chair is not subject to debate on or appeal on left upon a substantive motion. That was my rendition. And when I made that submission, the chair knew that I was right. And that ended the matter. So, Mr. Speaker, it's not like we are objecting to anything. And even if you listen to my earlier rendition today, Mr. Speaker, I came at the 73. And Mr. Speaker, I ask you, we are leaders and we must have faith in each other. And I was at the Speaker's lobby and we discussed on matters that we are going to discuss today. And we agreed on what was supposed to be done. Mr. Speaker, at nowhere did you even tell us that such a motion or a member has sought your notice. So, Mr. Speaker, that is why I came today and at the 73. I know very well, Mr. Speaker, if the Honorable Deputy Majority, Second Deputy Majority Chief Whip, Mr. Speaker, had notified you that he was going to raise a matter or a motion on content of Parliament, Mr. Speaker, you would have notified leadership and provision would have made for that. On the 73, is not. it is said that as soon as Mr. Speaker has been notified, and in the day that it's going to be replaced, there will be provision or time allotted for that. Mr. Speaker, 
where we are now, I strongly believe that Mr. Speaker, you've not been notified. And that is why you didn't tell us. So what he's doing now, Mr. Speaker, I don't want us to get with a tangent whereby leaders will be having mistrust. Mistrust is the foundation of the Constitution. We must trust each other. And we must believe in each other. And we must share ideas with each other. What has transpired today, we've agreed upon. And what we said we were going to do, we've almost finished. So if this was part of today's business, Mr. Speaker, we would have been told. So yesterday's issue was different from this. Our opposition was by Order 98, where we said the ruling of the chair or direction of the chair was not subject to debate. And if they wish, they should come by substantive motion, which they didn't do. So today, application has been made to you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Speaker. If per the application I'm also making, or the guidance I'm seeking, if he had notified you, before you and your God, you know. Before me, I'm a God, Mr. Speaker, I know. So I don't want to go into that tangent. I just want to read. It was just a guidance. Mr. Speaker, has the Honorable Deputy Majority Whip notified you on this and you didn't tell us? Did he seek your notice that he wanted to raise a motion on content of Parliament? These are matters you want to seek the guidance from the chair. Mr. Speaker, it's different from yesterday. The direction of the ruling came before we read the, the, the objection. So he shouldn't say that, oh, because Sami Jemfi is a member of the National Democratic Congress, that's why not. Mr. Speaker, and secondly, I know if he notified you, you would discuss matters like this with the right honorable speaker. And leadership will be part of it. Mr. Speaker, I know that is how we, will, we, we support you. Come and just tie your hands. Mr. Speaker, I know we should not provoke debate or to bring you into the debate. But as leaders, we should not sit here for any honorable member in this house to time the speaker's hand and let the speaker give a certain decision which he has not discussed with neither leadership or the right honorable speaker. The speaker, I arrest, arrest my case. Yes. Honorable members, uh, I don't think there is the need for any, any, any debate uh, again. Uh, it's a motion that he moved. And my personal diff Mr. Speaker, I need to correct something. Mr. Speaker, no, 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 please, Mr. Speaker, for the record, Mr. Speaker, uh, he's giving the permission. Hello, Honorable Leader, please, you talk, this side will talk. My personal difficulty is the foundation that my deputy rep came uh, with. That's uh, order 91. That's my personal difficulty, which has uh, more or less nothing to do with complaints for outsider to the house. That's my, my difficulty. Uh, I will have had no problem admitting it if he had come under, under uh, order 78. 91 is a bit problematic for me, which, so, honorable members, honorable members, honorable members, please, 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 please. Okay, major, ma, ma, deputy majority leader. Deputy um, majority leader, let me hear you. Um, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Chief, you have already moved the motion, isn't it? Yes. Deputy majority leader, let me hear you. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I shall humbly refer you to order 27. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Order 27 reads, notwithstanding anything contained in these orders, Mr. Speaker may refer any question of privilege to the Committee of Privileges for examination 
investigation and report. Mr. Speaker, my humble contention is that the fact that he mentioned Order 91B as part of the lex upon which he mounts his application does not make his application fatal. Mr. Speaker, because, Mr. Speaker, for the avoidance of doubt, what does that provision say? Mr. Speaker, for the avoidance of doubt, what does that provision say? Mr. Speaker, it simply says that a matter of privilege suddenly arises. However, Mr. Speaker, however, Mr. Speaker, the member goes on to refer to the conduct itself under 38. He makes reference to 38, which reference is in respect of the conduct of the person he is seeking your leave to refer to the Privileges Committee. He again makes reference to the very matter, the subject matter of his application, and goes on to refer, Mr. Speaker, to order 28 and 27. So, Mr. Speaker, I am saying that the argument is all about the substance. What is the substance? The substance of his argument clearly is that in course of our proceedings, um, a pe some other person has come out to make certain statements to the public and these statements amount to contempt of the house, including the chair. And he has read them aloud. Mr. Speaker, all that you are doing is to refer. You are not dealing with the substance. If the referral goes to the, the committee to look at it and comes in with a report, Mr. Speaker, so be it, Mr. Speaker. And I need to also remind this house that in yesterday's, Mr. Speaker, in yesterday's application, it was never even seconded. If that is the route we are going, we know that in... All because of Kennedy Adepo. Mr. Speaker, you put on your mic when I'm on the feet. Honorable Shuini, please. Mr. Speaker, if you are going... Okay, you want to point of order? Go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we have conduct conduct that amounts to contempt of parliament and conduct that amounts to breach of privilege. They are two different, but they are all captured in the same chapter. So if you don't study closely, you will think they are the same, but they are not the same. Matters of privilege relate to a member of parliament or a non-member of parliament who is a witness before parliament. If you are a member of parliament, you enjoy privileges here. If you are a non-member of parliament and you have been invited to come and give evidence here, then you enjoy the privileges. But if you are not a member of parliament, your conduct outside parliament, so far as it undermines what is happening here, amounts to contempt of parliament. So, Mr. Speaker, raising, raising issues of contempt of parliament which will normally happen outside parliament is not the same as raising a matter of privilege. And Mr. Speaker, even under Order 73, 73, you could actually exercise your powers as Speaker to admit the motion. Because 73 2 says that in urgent circumstances, such complaints may with Mr. Speaker's prior permission be made at a time other than that appointed for it. But Mr. Speaker, how urgent is a matter that took place five months ago? How urgent? How urgent is a matter that took place five months ago? That was common knowledge to everybody. That, 
that, that they didn't consider it and sent me to this house. And then it was only one yesterday, a con an issue of privilege was raised in this house and admitted. Now all of a sudden, people have gone to resurrect a matter that is five months old and claiming agency and wanting you to admit such a matter as a matter of complaint. So, Mr. Speaker, on, on both counts, on both counts, Mr. Speaker, both on the count of seeking your leave and giving you notice, they have failed. And on the count of the matter being agent, they have failed. On both counts, Mr. Speaker. So this is a matter that should not be entertained at all. Mr. Speaker, I think we should make progress in this, in this year proceedings. Yeah. Sit down. Yes, Honorable, the mover of the motion. What, what, uh, what else do you want? Thank you, you have right, for? Honorable Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we are in your hands and for guidance, and I think I've been guided enough. And I wish to amend my motion to come under order, to come under order 78, to come under order 78. And I am fortified by order 28, and I stand by the argument put under order 27 and that of 30 for the contempt issue to be referred to the committee of privilege. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Speaker, as I said, I come under Order 78 and I'm fortified by Order 28. And I therefore bring your attention to the comment made by Honorable Semi JP, the National Communication Officer of the NDC. And Mr. Speaker, part of uh, what he said on the 14th was, Comrade, the betrayal we have suffered in the hands of the Speaker of Parliament, Honorable Retai al -Bambabin, the leadership of the parliamentary group, particularly Honorable Haruna Idrisu, Honorable Muntaka Mohammed, and dozens of our MPs, and is what threatened me to work harder for the NDC to regain power. They blatantly defy the leadership of the party and betray the collective group of their selfish interests. And we must not let them succeed in their parochial quest to destroy the NDC. The party that we have done so much for them and all of us. Mr. Speaker, if you look at this, it is in breach of our orders. And then I therefore accordingly move that um, this matter will be referred to the Committee of Privileges on the strength of Order 27. And with your permission, Mr. Speaker, I read Order 27. Notwithstanding any contained in this order, Mr. Speaker may refer any question of privilege to the Committee of Privileges for examination, investigation and report. And Mr. Speaker, by this ostracism, he is clearly in contempt of Parliament under Order 38. And Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I read Order 38, which says that the following acts or conduct shall constitute a breach of privilege or contempt of parliament. So it says publication of false, pervertive, misleading, disorder, fabrication or scandalous report, books or rival referring on the proceedings in parliament. Mr. Speaker, I so move. Yeah. Yes. No, if he's talking about contempt of parliament. Uh, Mr. Speaker. Yes. I, I thank you for the opportunity to make my views heard in this matter. Mr. Speaker, first of all, the mover of the motion ought to have seek leave. Or, in doing so, you ought to have sought your leave to amend his motion. No, 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 no. No, 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 Mr. Speaker, when the mover of the motion was on his feet, 
we listened to them carefully, we were quiet. So, so they should be quiet and listen to me. Mr. Speaker, first of all, there's a procedural misstep in this matter. When he caught your attention, he simply zoomed into amending his motion and moving it without seeking your leave and and same being granted so first of all that was wrongful two now the the mover of the motion now seeks to hide under order 27 that notwithstanding mr speaker if i may read notwithstanding anything contained in these orders mr speaker may May refer any questions of privilege to the Committee of Privileges for Examination, Investigation, and Reports. Now, now, the may they suggest that where where you are calling on the speaker to exercise a discretion, you ought to have followed procedure properly. Now. Now, proceed on the line. Now, you came to this house and proceeded, and first of all, proceeded under 30H. Now, it, under 30H, the duty behoves on you to first of all even furnish the house, the evidence. The evidence. No, yesterday this matter came up. And the mover of the motion was instructed by speaker to furnish the house with the evidence upon which he was lying or relying in order to pray the house for the matter to be referred. So far, the honorable member has failed to furnish the house any sort of evidence suggesting that indeed a member, a member of the general public has conducted himself in such a manner that is contemptuous. Of, of parliament and for that matter the speaker so mr speaker you cannot be reading order 30 sub h in isolation from the procedure provided under order 73 clearly you have to satisfy the requirement under 73 so mr speaker not let it be heard anywhere or be said anywhere that we on the other side of the house are objecting to a member who seeks to bring a matter of privilege for proper attention of the house. No. All we are saying is that follow the procedure under 73. And when you properly invoke the jurisdiction of the house, the matter will be gone into. But for now, you are running yourself into procedural roadblocks and you will properly who properly oppose you. So we urge you to withdraw the motion, go and put your house in order, and, don't come and back come back, again. Don't come and then we'll deal with the matter don't properly. Come back again. Uh, we've heard a lot. Uh, the mover of the motion has amended the foundation. Only that he didn't even seek my, my, my permission to, to, to move the, the, the motion. Uh, I am inclined to defer the ruling to tomorrow. That's my, that's my ruling. You, you give the uh, ruling tomorrow. Yes, leadership. Speaker. 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 Yes, Speaker. Speaker, I believe we can we can now take items numbered seventeen and eighteen on both pages nine and ten, Speaker. Item 17 on page 9 and 18 on page 10. Yes. 
page 9, item number 17, motion by the chairman of the finance committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to move that the procedural motion listed as item 17 be taken now. I so move, Mr. Speaker. Yes, any second? Yes, yes I, member I, for, for, for uh, Hose Central. Yes, I second the motion. Honorable members, this procedural motion, as many as are in favor of the motion, say ah. Those against the motion say no. The eyes have it. The motion is adopted. Yes. Item number 18. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise to move the motion listed as item 18 and in doing so present your committee's report which the speaker you refer to the, to the finance committee and which referral was treated with officials uh, from the ministry of finance and also ministry of education the speaker, I request yeah, the Hansa Department to capture the full content of the report. It is a request for waiver on materials, equipment, and works required to be procured for the, Ghana, the China Aided Phase Two project at the University of Health and Allied Sciences (UAS) at Bo in the Volta region. Mr. Speaker, the particular tax handles for which exemptions are being sought are listed under paragraph 4.1. And the master list that tells us the specific items that the import exemptions would cover is hereby attached. Mr. Speaker, it is a committee's recommendation that this House adopt this report and grant the requested exemptions. I so move, Mr. Speaker. Yes, any second. Honorable Member for Who Central. Mr. Speaker, I second the motion once more uh, for the approval of the requests for waivers of taxes, duties, etc to enable the China aided history project at the University of Health and Allied Sciences project to be carried out. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the University of Health and Allied Sciences uh, currently occupies the facilities built by China under uh, the first phase. Throughout the history of this university, the Chinese have been the major funding and source for the entire university. Uh, through the direct contact between the late Professor Mills and then the Chinese uh, government. This particular phase is to enable the construction of a school of nursing and midwifery, as well as the central administrative block. Now, Mr. Speaker, Article 11 of the, the agreement clearly requires that tax waivers should be granted to the Chinese side for them to import whatever they need or purchase whatever they need locally to be able to carry out the, the project. It is in this respect that the request 
is being placed before this house. Now, Mr. Speaker, we note that this particular contract was signed in 2019, and the project should have started in the second quarter of 2020. So we are definitely behind time. That is why I will urge, as the Finance Committee has uh, already done, that we quickly approve this to enable the project to take off. It's expected to be completed within 38 months of uh, uh, commencement. So, Mr. Speaker, I once more urge all members to unanimously approve this request so that the project can take off. I thank you. Honourable members, the motion has been moved and is seconded. It's now before us. I will invite Honourable Member for Okanku Central. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I believe this is a straightforward application before you. And um, the government of this motion is well captured under paragraph 5.2, which deals with the scope, project scope under phase 2. I think it's a project that the honorable member for Ho Central has been following keenly and very dear to the heart of the government of Ghana. I believe that the scope of works as captured under Table 2 speaks volumes of the project that we are seeking to uh, promote with this waiver that is before us. And the benefits that the committee observed under 5.3 that when completed, the project will help to reduce the infrastructure deficit by expanding the, and complement the facilities already constructed under Phase 1. Phase 1, Mr. Speaker, was essentially to accommodate one of eight schools and three institutions of the university, which I believe is very inadequate. And this House has to give its weight behind this motion and get the project started under Phase 2. Mr. Speaker, with these few words, I support the motion. Thank you. Yes, honourable member for who, who was. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, um, I seek your leave to amend or to correct the motion. If you look at the motion, before I add my voice to the motion, if you look at the motion, the motion seeks to ask for tax exemption to the tune of 11 million 11 million 512,946 but the report Mr. Speaker has 11 million 512,095.99 dollars. So if that can be corrected, can be corrected. Mr. Speaker, having said that, I support the motion since this project started uh, some six years ago. The phase one, uh, myself and Honorable Kwame Agoja were part of the phase one and signing the agreement with the Chinese government, the approval at that time was that if we would construct the project and allow the project to come on board, they would give us the phase two. And fortunately, the first phase was completed, students have gone through, and this school has turned out medical officers in this country. Mr. Speaker, it is just good that when a friend visits you in a house or a visitor comes to you at home and presents gifts to you, 
you are also to reciprocate. This is a grant. It's a free money. And they are requesting us to take away at least the tax component of it. And therefore, it's our duty as a nation to accept this grant. It is not even a concessionary loan. It's just a grant. And for us, the best to do for them is to accept the fact that we will take the tax component of it. Mr. Mr. Speaker, with this few words, I support the motion and urge my colleague all to vote for this motion so that the project will continue. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Honorable Chairman, do you want to? Yeah, yes, Mr. Speaker, I'd I, I like to briefly speak to the correction that the Honorable Member pointed to. I agree with him. There's a difference between what is advertised on the other paper and what is in our report. Uh, for the record, the exemptions that we are requesting, because uh, of the discussions that happened between the Minister of Finance and the Finance Committee after they had laid this, is what is contained in the report, namely 11,512,095.99 US dollars. So that correction, uh, Mr. Speaker, should be made. I thank you. Very well. Yes, Majority, Deputy Minority Leader. Yeah, uh, Mr. Speaker, just to again alert the Chairman that he relied on the assessment made by the GRE. But if you if you look at the 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 document, if you can take a look at it, let me show you the total column for the total tax liability computed. The figure quoted by the GRE is nine million three hundred and twenty one thousand six hundred and sixty six dollars three cents. But if you, come, if you add up the figures, it's about 10 point something million. It's about 10.394. So, so you, can, you should not make this known to the GRA people that they've done proper, uh, they didn't do proper computation. Just to draw your attention to it. Because we have attached this document to this report, which is misleading. Yes. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, yes, it's right. GRA does the assessment. But the actual exemption given is determined when the Minister of Finance has submitted a request to us and the committee looks at the request. Because there are times when we would advise that certain commodities that, for instance, can be obtained in Ghana, we think the nation should not grant import duty exemptions on when they can procure them domestically. We had a few of this some were removed, some were added. That is how come we had this revision. So uh, the, the figure that should go into the resolution, Mr. Uh, uh, Speaker, is to state again 11,512,095.99 uh, US dollars. And uh, 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 the, consequentially, all the figures must converge on, on this figure. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable members, at the conclusion of the debate, the question is, as many as are in favour of the motion, say aye. Those against the motion, say no. Honourable members, the ayes have it. The motion is hereby adopted. Yes. Leader. May we take item 19 on page 10? Yes. Item 19, page 10, resolution, Minister for Finance. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that the resolution captured as item 19 on today's order paper be adopted now. I so move, Mr. Speaker. Yes, Honorable Member for Who Central. Mr. Speaker, I second the motion. Honorable Members, the resolution is moved and seconded. As many as are in favor of the resolution say aye. Those against say no. Honorable Members, the ayes have it. The resolution is adopted.
Yes, Honorable Leader. Speaker, addendum paper, um, item A. Yes, Honorable Members, addendum 2. Addendum 2. Item number A. Presentation of papers by the Minister for Finance. Loan agreements between the government of the Republic of Ghana, represented by the Ministry of Finance, and Carbon Ghana Limited as facility agent, mandated lead arranger, lender, and security agents and other financial institutions as original lenders for an amount of 170 million United States dollars to finance the provision of sports infrastructure and residential facilities for the hosting and organization of the 13th All African Games Accra 2023. Honorable members, the documents is duly presented. It is refer to the Committee for Finance for consideration and report. Yes, B. Minister for Youth and Sports. So that respect, the referrer just, your referrer, I, I will seek your leave if it pleases you, that we add the leadership of the sports, if a sports committee, onto the first referral. Honourable members, the referral goes to finance committee. Now, B, Minister for Youth and Sports. Commercial agreements between the government of the Republic of Ghana, represented by the Ministry of Youth and Sports, and Contractor Construction UK Limited, for an amount of 145 million, 86,057 United States dollars and 54 cents, for the provision of sports infrastructure and residential facilities for the hosting and organization of the 13th All African Games, Accra 2023. Honourable members, the report is duly presented. It is referred to the Committee on Youth and Sports for consideration and report. I, I. Commercial agreements between the governments of the Republic of Ghana represented by the Ministry of Youth and Sports and CONSA Limited for an amount of 34 million 120,135 United States dollars for the provision of sports infrastructure and residential facilities for the hosting and organization of the 13th All-African Games, Accra, 2023. Honorable members, the report is duly presented. It is referred to the Committee on Youth and Sports. Honorable Minister, I, I, I. Commercial agreements between the government of the Republic of Ghana, represented by the Ministry of Youth and Sports, and Mawoons Limited for an amount of 16 million, 66,961 United States dollars and 20 cents for the, for the refurbishment of Ligon Hostel facilities as Games Village for the hosting and organization of the 13th All African Games, Accra 2023. Honourable members, the report is duly presented. It is referred to the Committee on Youth and Sports for consideration and report. Yes, leader. Speaker, we may now go on to the original of the paper and take item 7. Speakers, I will seek your leave. Item 7, page 3. Page 3, item 7. Presentation of papers. And speaker, I'll seek your leave.
for the papers to be laid, that is item A to D, all of it, to be laid by the Deputy Majority Leader. Yes, Speaker, let me amend my application and rather seek your leave for the Minister for Youth and Sports to do the laying of the papers. And as Speaker indicated earlier, we are laying A to D. Yes, Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we have no objection to the application made by the Honourable. Honorable Majority Chief. But Mr. Speaker, as was raised at the lobby this morning, a lot of papers are being laid, but our orders are very clear. Mr. Speaker, if you go to Order 75, it says that as soon as sufficient copies are available at the clerk's office. Mr. Speaker, what is now happening is that after bringing few copies and laying it, all the members, 275 members of parliament in this house, sometimes only committee members are being given copies. Mr. Speaker, for oversight purposes, I came here, Mr. Speaker, in 2009. Mr. Speaker, when we started Copies were given to every member of every member that was laid. Copies were given to every member. It helps in our reading. It helps in our research. It helps in our oversight. So if somebody is able to stay here for even four years, the amount, the kind of knowledge that person gets, the speaker, he is able to oversight almost every sector. Even restricted to only committee members, it doesn't help. Secondly, Mr. Speaker, the class office received sufficient copy. That is the provision in our standing orders. But Mr. Speaker, the MMDAs should not make it a habit of just bringing one copy just to give to the clerk and that paper is laid. And after it's laid, then we'll be chasing for where are copies and where are these. It doesn't help in oversight. So Mr. Speaker, by convention, what even sometimes happens? is that to be certain when the clerks are demanding for the copies they are not demanding the copies for themselves they are demanding for the copies to be given to honorable members and i will opine that the speaker before the paper is laid it is my opinion that the speaker at least when the class receives copies he gives some to the majority bench and the minority bench for perusa before laying and once it is laid Copies should be given to almost every member, all the 275, so that people will not go on air, oh, this document was brought to Parliament, oh, it was not brought, it was laid, it was not laid. These are some of the reasons why, why certain arguments are being made certain times. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to appeal to you to direct the table office and the class office to make sure that sufficient copies of every paper going forward that is laid is now ready for distribution. With this view, Mr. Speaker, I thank you, and I still count on you to give a direction in that regard. Well, well, well. Um, I think this is fundamental. Honorable table members, please take note. Um, papers must be made available to honorable members. At times, it becomes a bit embarrassing that uh, you are a member of parliament and an issue will come up or approval has been given and you may not be privy to it simply because you were not given uh, a copy of the paper. So, uh, table, please take note and let's see how to address this issue. But uh, that notwithstanding, honorable members, I'm informed that at times some of the papers are also given to us. When you go to our pigeon holes, our pigeon holes are full. So, let's try and empty our pigeon holes. Because most of these papers are given to us far ahead of, ahead of time. 
So whilst we are urging the table to uh, make papers available to us, let's also try and go to our pigeon holes and see what is there. So on that note, uh, I will ask the chief whip, majority chief whip, to go ahead with the uh, laying of the papers. Now we ask a uh, minister for sport. Minister for Youth and Sports to do that on behalf of us. Okay. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Ghana Prison Service for the year 2020. Honorable members, the report is duly represented. It is referred to the Committee on Interior and Defense to consider it and report back to the House. B. Honorable Minister. Honorable Minister, B. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Department of Social Welfare for the year 2019. The report is due represented, Honorable Members. It is referred to the Committee on Gender, Children and Social Protection for consideration and report. Honorable Minister, C. C. I. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Sunyani Technical University for the year 2020. The report is due represented, Honorable Members. It is referred to the Committee on Education for consideration and report back to the House. Honorable Minister CII. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Ghana Institute of Journalism for the year 2020. Yes. Honorable members, the report is duly presented. It is referred to the Committee on Education for consideration and report back to the House. Yes. Um, Honorable Minister D. D. I. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Ministry of Aviation for the year 2020. Honorable members, the report is duly presented. It was referred to the Committee on Transport for consideration a report to the House. Honourable Minister D. I. I. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Driver and Vehicle Licensing Authority for the year 2018. Yes. Honourable Members, the report is duly presented. It's referred to the Committee on Transport for consideration and report back to the House. Honorable Minister D I I I. Annual statement by the Audit Committee of the Driver and Vehicle Licensing Authority for the year 2019. Honorable Member, the report is duly presented. It is referred to the Committee on Transport for consideration and report. Yes, Honorable Deputy Leader. Right, Honorable Speaker, I move that this house be adjourned till tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. I so move. Yes, Honorable. Mr. Speaker, I write to second the motion. Honorable Members, I think we've not even spent four hours as usual, so I wouldn't take the motion. I will go ahead. We started at quarter to three, and it's now 6.15. So it's less than four hours. We haven't actually, so I wouldn't take the, I wouldn't take the motion. I'll go ahead to adjoin the house. The house is... Yes, uh, Honorable Leader, you are right. The, the, we, we haven't spent more than four hours. So you are, you are within your right to move the motion. 
The motion has been moved and seconded. As many as are in favor of the motion say aye. aye. Those against the motion say no. no. Now, members, the ayes have it. The motion has been adopted. This house is accordingly adjourned to tomorrow, the 16th of July 2021 at 10 a.m. Tomorrow is Friday, so we are sitting at 10 a.m. Yeah, members are enjoying to come on time.